Uh, some ground rules. Uh, attendees can only type your questions uh, in the question panel at the lower section of your screen, as may be displayed on your mobile device. Uh, we may. What, <clears throat> what we do is uh, we collate all these uh, questions and then we'll feed them to the panelists during the question and answer session. Thank you once again for joining us. We invite uh, Mary Iwelumo now. Uh, Mary is our government and public services DE for PWC Nigeria. Uh, Mary will be delivering the introductory remarks to get us going. Mary, over to you. Thank you for joining us. I hope we all are into the safety guidelines that have been released to date. I am confident that together we'll get through this challenging time. It has resulted in government and I dare say non-governmental institutions with the lack of enabling infrastructure to support remote working and service delivery is of major concern in this, what is aptly called the new normal. Hence, there is urgent need for government and the public sector as a whole to invest in business continuity management efforts in order to speedily adapt to this new normal. This, ladies and gentlemen, is the crux of our discussion this afternoon. As a firm, PwC is working closely with organizations, governments, and other stakeholders to help them prepare and respond to the different scenarios emerging in our new normal. To do this, we leverage experience with previous epidemics from around the world. As part of our response, we have galvanized our partners, staff, and alumni to contribute in cash and in kind to a resource pool called PwC Cares. Through PwC Cares, we are coordinating our COVID-19 intervention efforts, which include providing project management support to the CACOVI Coalition, who is leading the private sector response to this pandemic, development and deployment of a knowledge hub to support businesses and governments in her response, hosting of webinars of this nature, provision of palliative materials and the provision of palliative materials to the vulnerable and health institutions across several states. We can all agree that the impact of COVID-19 will linger long after the pandemic ceases. The extent of the impact, as we must all know by now, will depend on how governments, businesses, other stakeholders, and how we respond. Ever, we see the partnerships between stakeholders, especially between the public and private sector, is key to success. Essentially, we all need to prepare not just to deal with the current challenges, but also to jump at our readiness for the post-COVID-19 era. In this respect, I greatly appreciate our panelists for taking time out of their busy schedules to join us this afternoon. I look forward to a very insightful session and connecting with you all beyond this webinar as we continue to do what is necessary to remain resilient. So I yield back to Damola. Kindly oblige me in observing a moment's silence for the lives lost to this pandemic. Thank you, Mary. So before I uh, introduce the panel, I would like to set the scene by highlighting some key elements of uh, business continuity management and also some challenging adaptation of uh, Nigerian public services currently facing in this area. So business continuity management is 
Currently, DFTO works on sharing business operations and sustain in the event of an unforeseen crisis. That's missing. That's as we are This includes disaster recovery, uh, crisis management, health and safety issues. And then the efforts relating to uh, government and public services are uh, usually geared towards ensuring that we activate our plan B if we have one. Uh, that government and public services continue their operation no matter what happens in some form. That the government and public service will recover quickly after the major crisis and emergency. Uh, the organization of the uh, the public sector will be resilient enough to withstand any occurrence and bounce back to full operation. I'm sure we are the, the, you all agree with me that we are struggling with a uh, few of these uh, in few of these areas at the moment. So the PCM in government services is a view from lenses of the capability of the speaker, civil servant, and the efficiency of its processes. And then the scalability of this technology. And the civil service needs to have capabilities and motivation to be able to work in a way that is required in this situation, essentially remote working. And the processes need to be enabled through technology and standardized, and they have to be automated. Uh, and last uh, but not the least, we need to have very robust technology to have uh, all this, these processes and this uh, new way of So, with that background, we looked at the, the uh, challenges that we're currently exposed to, why it is difficult for civil service to operate close to uh, the level that is required and that some other sectors have been able to, to achieve. Fragmentation of the workflow and the bureaucracy, I don't need to say more about that. Uh, unfortunately, the technical skill, especially IT skills of the people in the public sector needs to be so for improvement for that. Uh, the lack of transparency in the processes and procedures, this don't have any one process for, we have a lot of um, variations in, in our processes, so automating and having one consistent process is always been a challenge. Uh, the lack of digital infrastructure. Uh, people don't have the right tools to be able to work from outside the office. Well, I was on another seminar earlier with, and somebody was saying, not that people are not working from home. Civil servants are not working from home. They cannot work from home. Yes. And then there is the absence of a disaster management uh, as a culture in the public sector. Next slide, please. Okay, so where where are these letters? So um, either we like it or not, it's not sustainable. The the, uh, the mode of operation within the government and public sector it relies on paper. Uh, it's making it a lot difficult uh, for any any remote for any remote um, operations to be, to be possible. Um, and again. With the advent of COVID-19, this has revealed and exposed all the gaps in the government and public services that are unable to operate as a business as a usual. Next slide. So, and where does all these lead us, and what is our what are, what are our point of view? We're looking at um, three basic areas, just as uh, Mary mentioned as well in our introductory remark. We need to. Uh, Look at the business processes, uh, make them uh, efficient and effective and automated, have the right technology in place. And most importantly, and we'll be talking a bit more of this uh, later in the, in the sessions, develop the workforce. We need to invest significantly in uh, upskilling civil servants on digital, uh, digital literacy. Um, the world has changed, and uh, for us to move, and catch up with the rest of the world. We can no longer uh, be where we are. We've had so many attempts at uh, doing, and I've been part of a few of those uh, unsuccessful attempts at doing uh, e-governance in the country. Now we have to stop paying the service to that and then get serious about making sure that it works. 
So with this uh, background, and I have the pleasure of introducing our distinguished panelists for today. We have with us Mr. Inua Kashifu Abdullahi. Mr. Abdullahi is the Director General of the Nigerian Information Technology Development Agency. He's a technology expert and Director General of NITA. Uh, before joining NITA, he worked at uh, Galactic Backbone and also at Central Bank of Nigeria. Uh, with over 15 years' experience in IT operations, business transformation, and solution architecture across both private and public sectors. Abdullahi graduated with a Bachelor's of Technology degree in Computer Science from Abuba Katapa Valley University in Kochi. He's a MIT Sloan trained strategist and a certified project manager. He was the first Cisco certified internet network expert in Nigeria public. He also has many professional certifications in networking, telecommunication, service management, and solution design. His achievement as a technology architect was the production of a seven solution architecture for physical IT initiatives that helped in achieving cashless society while at CB. Unfortunately, uh, due to some last minute uh, change in his schedule, Abdullah can't be with us, but he's able represented by Barrister Kashim Shodangi, the National Coordinator for Office of Nigerian Content Development in ICT of NICTA. I also have with me on the panel Mr. Mohamed Sani Abulai. Mr. Abulai is the Chief of Staff to Kaduna State Governor. He was appointed the Chief of Staff to the Governor after serving as the Commissioner of Budget and Planning in Kaduna. Before his appointment as Commissioner in Kaduna State, Lai worked closely with Secretary General Ban Ki moon to York, and United Nations Deputy Secretary General Amina Mohammed as policy advisor. Earlier, he worked as an economist and Deputy National Program Manager for the Millennium Development Goals at the Nigerian Presidency. He also served as an economic advisor to the Nigerian Governors Forum. In 2018, he was one of the two Nigerians appointed to the World Bank Expert Advisory Council on Citizen Engagement. He has a master's degree in development economics and policy from the University of Manchester and obtained a second master's from Amado Bello University, where he studied international affairs and diplomacy. He obtained certificates in public finance and School of economics, sustainable development at Columbia University and advanced project management at Oxford University. As Commissioner of Budget and Planning in Kaduna, he conducted an in-depth analysis of the local SDG data to advance the implementation of the goals. He was a member of the United Nations Secretary General's team that designed the Sustainable Development Goal. I also have on the panel Dr. Fred Odiaka. Dr. Odiaka is a Professional Development Consultant and a Government and Public Sector Industry Expert. He's currently the Chairman of Beirut Integrated Services Limited, a firm of pro providing professional services to both the public and private sector. His areas of expertise span strategy development, implementation support, process engineering, organizational development, human resource management, public sector, financial management reforms. Before his retirement in 2019, Dr. Bert worked at PwC for over 27 years. He retired as the advisory leader and government and public sector industry leader. He also worked as an academic at the University of Abuja. Dr. Bert holds a PhD in organizational studies from the University of Ibadan, Nigeria, and MSc in industrial sociology from the same university. On the panel, I also have with me Femi Oshinobi. He's a partner in PwC and the leader of the Experience Center at Emerging Technologies of PwC West Africa. He's also the risk assurance leader, the leader of technology, infocoms, and entertainment industry in the whole of West Africa. He comes with over 20 years of experience across telecoms, financial services, and consulting in Europe, Middle East, and region. He is at the forefront of pushing advanced analytics. 
several conferences and workshops on emerging technologies across Africa. Femi is a computer science graduate, fellow, fellow chartered accountant, and holds an MBA from World Business School in the UK. To complete my esteemed panel list is Olu Shola Adewale. And Olu Shola is an associate director in PwC. He leads the people and organization practice in the West African area. Part of the advisory line of service is a strategic HR management leader who has led organizational effectiveness projects for leading Africa and multinational organizations in financial services, FMCG, oil and gas, government, and education. He is a respected leadership development expert. His core expertise include the design and execution of HR strategies, performance management systems, Learning and development, and lately digital workforce transformation. Shola will be telling us a bit more about digital workforce transformation later. Shola is a member of the PwC Global Initiatives of Skilled Nations and Organization for the Digital World. He holds a master's degree in human resource management from the Ohio State University, Fisher College of Business, and bachelor's degree in geography. That you agree with me that we have. Um, very esteemed and very strong uh, panel, and we're looking forward to a very uh, insightful. To get us going, I would like to invite the panelists. I want to give each of the panelists uh, to share their initials on the panel. We're starting uh, by talking on the people's staff to the governor, Mr. Mohamed Abdul Hamid. Okay. Thank you very much, um, Damala. Good afternoon. Um, team panel and our and everybody that has joined us on this call. It's a pleasure to be here to share some thoughts on this important um, topic. Um, I just want to start off um, by saying that um, for us in Kaduna State, um, as you all know, um, the uh, pandemic that's going on hit us um, pretty hard very early. Um, our governor um, himself was um, infected by the virus and had to uh, go on um, treatment for about uh, 26 days, um, which also elicited a number of us also going into um, isolation, being tested, and going through that entire process. So for us, it's been a very deeply personal um, um, event that has happened. Um, uh, and has hit us, uh, I mean, uh, uniquely um, in a way that, you know, this topic really speaks to about how do you um, continue um, governance. I know that the topic is business continuity, but for us, um, we look at it as, as governance um, continuity and how do you ensure that government continues to, to run even at the worst of emergencies like what we have found ourselves. Um, to step back um, a little bit, you know, since the outbreak of this virus, I mean, governments across the world have been under increased pressure um, to stop the outbreak from spiraling into a global health emergency. It is already a global health emergency today. Uh, we have um, infectious cases um, in their millions, uh, people dying in, in hundreds of, of thousands across some of the most sophisticated countries with the best healthcare systems that we could um, imagine. So for us in Nigeria, I mean, we've been, the government has been trying really hard to ensure that we limit um, the spread, uh, limit community um, diseases, while also um, keeping public officers um, also safe and also continuing the most basics um, of, of, of service delivery um, as government. Um, several extreme measures have been deployed. Um, uh, in Nigeria and abroad, just grounding international flights, 
severe restrictions of movement, the stoppage of public gatherings, and all of that. So really, in, in, in summary, um, I mean, this pandemic has become sort of a balance um, between trying to save lives, um, trying to protect the livelihoods of our people, um, but also restricting liberties um, to be able to do that. So it's really um, a, a very unique challenge that has come up. And probably the biggest disruption, um, at least in my own lifetime and in many of us, um, this is probably the biggest disruption in government and business um, in our lifetimes. There has never been a time when we've all been um, at home, um, uh, secluded uh, for six weeks, seven weeks, some much even longer than that, and where we're facing really huge challenges that um, have to do with our own um, lives. Um, so at the beginning of all of this, and there was a, a school of thought that thought that, you know, this was um, a short term emergency that would be um, uh, over in a month, two months, and we'd all be back to work um, and, and doing what we used to do. Increasingly, as we can all see, this is not um, uh, an emergency with a limited horizon. It would, could last anything from a couple of months end of the year and even to next year, depending on how effective we are, first of all, in controlling the spread and how soon a vaccine becomes available. So we are now very, very much aware that, I mean, this has become a new normal and that we must be able to do the work that we used to do um, within the uh, restrictions that we find ourselves um, today. Um, knowing that, you know, the normal lives that we used to live before may not come back for probably a couple of months, um, a year, or maybe even um, forever. Um, we might not see the return to large-scale gatherings in a very long time. Um, and indeed, if you look through history, similar pandemics have lasted two years or more. And as I saw on TV the other day, um, the fastest a vaccine has been found has been five years. Um, we we're trying to do this one much faster. So, I mean, it's gloomy, um, but we must be able to find a way um, to continue to survive. So responsible governments across the world are looking at the ability um, to function um, and deliver public services to people even um, during uh, lockdowns with the possibility of reinfections and all of that. In that regard, then we must, um, as government, um, continue to be proactive. Um, uh, we must continue to push in clear, coordinated policies um, that, you know, ensure that we sustain the machinery of government because there will be no business or private sector continuity without public sector um, continuity without public sector resilience. Um, and so the public sector must, um, as a sense of uh, urgency, be able to retool itself um, to ensure that it can step in. So for us in Kaduna, what we've tried to do over the past um, couple of weeks is really to um, take this all in, but respond very, very quickly. Kaduna is on the front line. Um, uh, we're not an epicenter, but we are bordered by um, states that have um, significant amount of cases that are really um, elements of community transmission. We've been trying our best to protect our people and we've been trying to push through um, the activities of, of government. So, um, I mean, it, it, um, it was pretty important that when it hit us, we'd already started um, a sort of an IT transformation um, system for the last two, two and a half years within government. And that is what really has enabled us to be able to quickly migrate um, to ensure that we didn't lose a beat um, and be able to continue to meet, discuss, um, and carry out the activities um, of government. One of the first things that we did was to um, sit down and design what we call actually a governance continuation plan. Now that governance continuation plan um, takes uh, on board the early adoption of technology, the enhanced quality of our public servants, as you might well know if you've been following Kaduna over the past four or five years, we've been renewing our public service. In fact, 
when we came in, there was an aged, uh, Kaduna is a state that has 80% of its people under the age of 35. But the public sector was um, significantly older um, than the average age of the population. So you'd find the average age in public service around 50, 48, and, and all of that. So we started a con um, very conscious program. We called it the Public Sector Revitalization Program, where we tried to exchange as much as possible, uh, bringing young um, people into the system, um, both as political appointees and as core civil servants. So if you look at the system now, over the last five years, we've been able to achieve some of that transition to the point where we're almost now at 50-50 uh, or a bit 60-40 regarding the um, age ranges of the, of the state government. And if you look at most of our political appointees, these are very um, quality people that are able to um, really utilize um, technology. So this um, two things, the um, early adoption of technology and the enhanced quality of public service has made it possible for us now to quickly move on and continue um, our governance. Now, part of what the governance continuation plan um, uh, has is clearly that um, the executive council continues to meet um, on a monthly basis now. We have policy councils that meet every single day um, from human capital, economic development, infrastructure, procurement, institutional development. We meet every single day. And different groupings are in each um, each group. So I, for example, I chair the Infrastructure Council. I'm also a member of the Procurement Council. And my colleague, the Deputy Governor Her Excellency, chairs the Human Capital Council. And they meet every single, we meet on Wednesdays, the government Human Capital Council meets on um, Mondays, Economic Development Council chaired by the Senior Advisor Council to the Governor meets on um, Tuesdays. The SSG chairs the Institutional Council, which meets on Fridays. So I mean, these have now continued via video conferencing. Uh, we've been able to uh, coordinate with our local government chairman. Many of them are also uh, young, um, and and to do all of that. But I mean, so so for us, when we were um, looking at digital capabilities and and all of that, it was very clear that um, the workforce needs um, digital literacy. Um, the legacy systems need to interoperate. Um, identity management services need to be deployed. Um, how do we um, the digital infrastructure that we need to build. And these are huge expenses, both from a training perspective, from an infrastructure perspective, that we've had to go through over the last couple of years. Of course, we face a number of challenges, an old retiring public workforce that I've mentioned, a very, very paper-based um, system that has limited opportunity for innovation. If you look at the public service rules as they are, they are very paper-based and everything is secret and has to be minuted. You know, so these are some of the challenges that we've had to face over the couple of years. But we've now, in fact, because of COVID, been forced um, to issue out um, uh, executive orders that now move most of this um, online. So um, what have we really, the questions that have been plaguing us since this COVID era started? It's been around how do we provide digital engagements for all our internal and external um, um, partners, right? How do we ensure that government is, remains visible, continues to communicate with its people? How do we digitize our operations? How do we provide self-service? Yesterday, for example, I was walking through and I saw that our, uh, our, our urban property development organization had just moved um, building permits um, to online self-services. So I mean, th that's the transformation, you know, for us, it's, it's huge. So we're digitizing all of government now we're moving government government's digital presence online as much as possible. So these are some of the things that we, we continue to, to work on. Um, I'm not aware how much time I have. Um, could yeah, you I'll, 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 I'll say that it appears um, Canada State is doing uh, quite a lot. I was so excited to hear more of this. I'm sure during the course of the afternoon, we'll get to hear a little more about the things you are doing. Thank you so much for that very... Uh, insightful contribution. Thank you. I'll call on the barrister Kassim Shodani. So, you know, as a minister, the, the, the government is uh, relying on yourself and uh, Galaxy Gatun uh, to provide the infrastructure to support remote working in the country. How is the government responding to these things and how, what are you doing to help the uh, government to achieve this very critical? Uh, need at this moment. Good afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity to share 
um, our thoughts and the, um, developments of this end on um, being able to respond adequately as a government to the challenging provision of services to the public in the face of um, this pandemic and just this challenge that is before us all. It's completely black one, um, completely unanticipated, you know, um, um, with limited, you know, um, uh, sort of horizons of what need to, or what should happen. Uh, I'll say quickly that um, you know this is a challenge has affected government and government services greatly. There's no gain saying that. Um, and again, I'll quickly point out that um, the government has not been completely at zero. Um, so while you know tons of government offices have been unable carry out their, their work and duties as they should out to um, some other systems or processes that were initiated before now. I started providing you know, um, sort of the impetus or if you like fulcrum to other agencies of government to be able to deliver some limited service, you know, hoping and thinking through, you know, some of the strategies I would discuss in, in a bit. So what we've seen is there have been very levels of response to the challenges. We've definitely seen institutions like the Central Bank of Nigeria, and a couple of other agencies to, who have continued to basically function. It's not, it's no magic. You know, it just speaks to the investments that have been made prior to now um, in systems, infrastructure, and technology. You know, and competence levels, you know, the, the earlier speaker in his presentation, you know, uh, alluded to. I would say that um, the, the challenges remain and abound, and um, some of them we all know, which we must address, you know, um, a review of some of the process, legacy processes themselves that we inherited, basically designed around paper-based methods. Um, you know, those need to be reviewed a bit more holistically in light of new thinking, innovation, and sort of things that could happen. Um, there's the need also for uh, significant investments to overhaul and to invest in the right and appropriate technologies. You know, um, there's also the need for change management, you know, being able to acculturate and also accept and use adequately and optimally these, these technology with the right incentives. You know, these are all issues that must be considered as we, you know, continue our foray into finding solutions, um, you know, to enable and optimize the delivery of government services. I will say that frameworks like the e-government master plan that was approved last year by the Federal Executive Council sort of provide the ground, the ground rules and sort of the framework that government MDAs and parastatals need to deploy and understand, you know, and it also delineate roles and responsibilities for different stakeholders, you know, um, to implement, you know, these things. One of the key challenges are that you know, the procurement processes need to be revisited to consider how technology is bought. MDAs are primarily procuring entities. This also means that frameworks need to be, um, uh, some exist, but frameworks need to be strengthened so that we have interoperability becomes, you know, a key aspect of the operations of government. We also need to have joined up thinking, you know, and then we need a lot of cohesion and coherence, you know, in how services are deployed. You know, for the government, you know, in that um, in, in in that order, um, I would say that, uh, like I said, we're at zero. So one of the things that I recognized earlier, you know, 2019, uh, when the staff for information and economy was the general of need that Dr. Issa Ali Pantami, the issuance of um, a Nigerian cloud computing policy, the policy basically outlines the lawfulness and the use of cloud computing within given spots for the operations of government. This takes care of, you know, some of the otherwise large investments in infrastructure, some of the other disjoint things that may have happened. Just saying, I think there's an opportunity to use from co-location to IFRS, you know, uh, uh, class at various levels, thinking through, you know, cyber security issues, data classification issues, security and sort of operationalizing this to be able to ramp up you know, digital service delivery of government agencies. Um, there also was issued the uh, frameworks and guidelines, I 
IT serve, IT projects clear, basically which provided some classic ideas about sharing of infrastructure, plan projects, executing IT projects, just to guide, you know. But ultimately, the, we will need to consider innovative approaches and funding IT projects because we know that um, the budgets are under great strain, national revenues are under great strain. Uh, but we also need to pull the public service, equip, you know, our office, you know, and then again, I'll say, you know, adoption and implementation of the Steve Orasonye report is a master stroke in being able to, you know, harness and optimize, you know, government, you know, um, so because again, one, pre one challenge we had always been the disjointed nature of, um, or rather the challenges with mandates and overlapping mandates and so on. So the harmonization, you know, and the rationalization of the service would also be, you know, um, it, it, it would also be of great consequence of how we adopt and use technology optimally and effectively. I'd also say we need, you know, NIDA is working on new frameworks around managing, you know, um, managing data for, for, um, for public service decision making, um, also working on and will be issued in, 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 in a few days or in, in a week max, um, other regulations around en enterprise architecture and so on. But we will need to understand also that MDAs are procuring entities and at the core it needs to come back to MBA budgets and so on. So I'll leave it for him. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, we have the, the old day, we we'll like to speak for as long as um as we can because we're actually uh getting good insight and happy to know that the government is doing quite a lot on that thank you for your information um next um finally will be dr Beto Dierka. dr Dierka, so how can ministries departments and agencies in the uh, public sector realign their operation to enable efficiency and effectiveness in a partial lockdown uh, are there processes and operational changes required and how uh, what are these and can government customers because it's one thing to fix the the government uh the, the civil servant are the government customers able to adapt to these changes okay, okay uh, good afternoon and um thanks for having me um okay I, i'm quite impressed with uh, kaduna state as a matter of fact um but uh, and let me answer your questions directly because I think you've asked um, about uh, three or four, di four different questions that are linked. Uh, the first one, which has to do with how the MDAs can uh, realign their operations to enable efficiencies and effectiveness in a partial lockdown. A partial lockdown, as we know it, indicates that um, not all staff members um, would uh, would be expected to go to work as it is now um you have the senior some senior people going to work on certain days of the week and at reduced uh times as well okay so under that condition of course what you, you will expect is um, some redundancies here and there and also the fact that effectiveness will really not be there even under normal conditions we know we had issues, just as your initial presentation showed, we have issues with um, effectiveness and um, efficiencies in, in the public sector. Now, on that lockdown, the question is, how do we even improve on that? For me, the way to go is to adopt digital solutions and then review the attendant policies and procedures. And that's why I started by saying that I'm really impressed with Kaduna State. I will mention a few of, the, of, of that. What exactly do I mean you know, by, by, by that? Um, in simple language, all I'm saying is that MDAs have to realign their operations using modern technology and telecommunications. Now, creating that platform gives staff the opportunity to work from home or to work remotely. Your, your presenter showed the challenges uh, attached to that, which we all know very well. Now, working remotely um, has been called different names. It's called remote working, it's called teleworking, it's called telecommuting. All, all we're saying is that we need 
a platform, digital solutions that will enable people, given that some stay at home now, and given that even the senior ones who go to work spend not the normal times that they will, they will, they will spend and not the full days that will, they will spend. Now, it means MBAs have to create the platform that will enable them to work remotely. That is critical. Now, I, I, I like to know that uh, our president, you know, a few weeks ago directed the ministers of industry, trade and investment, communication and digital economy, science and tech, transportation, aviation, interior health, works and housing, labor and employment and education to jointly develop a comprehensive policy for a Nigerian economy functioning with COVID-19. So government is aware that it will not be business as usual. In other words, this idea of uh, working from nine to two or nine to three and working Monday, Wednesdays, Fridays, or some people even saying, I, I think I may, I may even prefer, prefer to start working from home. Now, it might be the new normal. So we have to start thinking out of the box, start thinking differently. And that's why I'm impressed with what um, our, our friend, the, the, the chief of staff to the Kaduna governor, you know, what, what he has told us. Uh, the, the, I just mentioned a few of the things, the issue of the governance continuation plan, which is fantastic. I will talk about that because uh, the word governance has been used because it's public sector. Um, that's generally what we call the business continuity plan. But in addition to our president giving that mandate to these ministers, you know, to come up with a way that work will continue even with COVID-19 and even after COVID-19, we know that looking at the private sector, because we can also learn from the private sector, we have a lot to learn from them. The Nigerian capital market, for instance, you know, uh, in, the, in, that, in the Nigerian capital market, the Nigerian stock exchange has been trading remotely. They've been working. And many listed companies that had the obligation of hosting their AGMs for the year ended 30th, 31st December last year, they, 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 they've gone online to fulfill this obligation of holding AGMs. You know, so the question is, can the public service or the public sector, can they do that as well? Yes, they can. Yes, they can. There are challenges, obviously, but can they? The answer is yes, clearly yes. Now, we heard from uh, the chief of staff that um, they've been having meetings. In fact, he said executive council meetings have been holding, okay, using um, um, teleconferencing and so on. They've even been having some, some daily meetings and so on, you know, using video conferencing. Fantastic ideas, which I think the other state governors or governments should emulate. The Lagos state government, for instance, on Monday, 30th March, they conducted their first ever virtual executive council meeting that was chaired by the governor himself. That is fantastic. That for me is the way to go. And we also know that um, several meetings have been held, not just within the public sector, between the, uh, within the private sector, but even the public sector. Some people have been holding meetings virtual meetings. That is the digital solution that I'm talking about. E-learning, I've heard the ministers of education, minister of state and minister of education talking about this e-learning, you know, so they've, they've tried to develop learning programs ranging from primary to secondary schools to tertiary settings, you know, putting resources in place to promote e-learning in the country as, as, as a whole. The government, the government minister, minister of education is actually encouraging this. So, Point I'm making is that, yes, I, I, I started by saying that the way to go is to, is to adopt digital solutions. We are already adopting it, but we, have, we still have a long way to go, a very long way to go. And maybe if we have the time to discuss this, we will talk about the, the, long, the, the challenges, which are so, they are, so they, are, they, are, they are humongous in Nigeria. But that doesn't mean that we cannot get there. We can. We can get there. We have what it takes to get there. We have, we have, we have the resources, human, material, financial, to get there. We, we, we just have to do what is proper to get there. Now, your second, second part of the question is idea processes, uh, operational changes required, and what are these? Of course, there are lots of operational changes required. We, we saw that uh, the Kaduna State government they, they, they developed this governance continuation plan which, like I said, is same as the business continuity plan. 
Now, I want to encourage MDAs to also develop that plan. They should come up with such a plan that they can, fall, that they can, they can rely on when they experience you know, a crisis, when issues come up that will disrupt workflow operations, uh, normal workflow operations. They must come up with this business continuity plan or what we have been called the governance continuation plan. Now, um, in addition to that, uh, it's, it's important that they have to review the civil service manual or handbook because there are so many HR issues that must be introduced. If we must get it right, um, uh, working under this the situation we'll find ourselves under the partial lockdown. For instance, okay. Thank you, Doctor. Um, I guess we I think we've got the, the, the end of it. Uh, very clear about your comments around the changes in the processes and uh, putting the right systems in place. And uh, finally, you we were talking about uh, the, the the people part. We, we need to change those processes before it can be efficient. And incidentally, I'm monitoring uh, the, the chat here, and uh, about one or two panelists agreed with you. I mean, one or two attendees agree with you. Uh, a comment here says the public service rule is actually not a barrier to digital working, but we need to make some adjustments and it will take off. It can work, just similar to, to what you said, Doctor. Thank you very much for that. Okay, I'm going to. Uh, Ask uh, Femi to talk to us now about the issue of digitization support uh, the government to be, to support the government in being more efficient and effective despite the lockdown. Uh, the question I have here: Can the current national infrastructure support the government in running a fully digitized uh, structure? How can the private sector help? Do we have laws that may need to be improved or newly enacted to support this initiative? What has worked in other climes uh, similar to Nigeria and how can Nigeria learn from this? Femi. Thank you, Damola. Um, um, and thanks to, to the previous panelists and the chief of staff, my dear friend, um, Barry Stashed and Dr. Odeka, Dr. Betts. And thanks for, I think uh, a lot has been covered in the last 30 minutes. And I will just probably Take this from uh, another perspective around the, the, the infrastructure. Um, COVID-19 pandemic has you know, sent countries around the world into uh, our, what I will call crisis mode, with many now having to cope with severe social isolation and physical distancing measures. You know, everywhere you go now, you're looking at people, you know, are they two meters <laughs> away from you or not? Um, so this is for citizens, organizations, and governments um, around the world to adapt as best they can, uh, as they can, in order to carry out uh, to carry on despite the enormous um, economic and social disruption. And and I hope Nigerians are really seeing the, especially the economic disruption that is actually uh, playing um, um, on at the moment. Uh, of course, there are many aspects of our lives and economies that cannot be shifted online. And we, we're talking about digital, but there are a few, there, there are so many things that we can move digital. Um, you know, for instance, the frontline workers we, we commend in and clapping for every day can suddenly staff ICUs or deliver food to, uh, we can deliver food to supermarket from behind the screen. Um, hotels and airlines can't fill empty beds and seats um, with digital subscriptions. And so every business uh, will suffer um, as the economic, um, downturn and disruption carries on. But nevertheless, far more activity seems to be finding a lifeline via the internet and that than you know we may have expected. Um, many of the technologies that we used to take for granted are now proving essential to maintain uh, maintaining some semblance of normality. I, I would use myself an example. I, I you know I travel a lot, Abuja in lots of states. I've actually had a lot of constructive meetings. I've been in, a lot in, in this lockdown for about seven weeks. Seven weeks um, I've been in lockdown. And um, um, what I'm beginning to see is that there are more meetings, more effective meetings, even with people at government. Um, I've had more meetings attended by government people in the last seven weeks, more than, you know, probably in the last one year. 
and this is just seven weeks. So everyone is really appreciating technology. And I must, I must commend, and I can actually confirm what the chief of staff is saying. You know, Kaduna is really progressive in terms of, um, you know, uh, you know, in terms of, you know, using technology and even restructuring the entire workforce. So they've really gone far, you know, ahead of uh, most of the states. Uh, you know, because of time, I'm just going to breeze through some things. Um, I, I tend to look at this, you know, people say consultants are always bringing framework. Um, a few things around how do we really go for this in terms of infrastructure or, you know, the internet we're seeing. What I'll be looking at is actually saying that, you know, we should turn this network networked public into an advantage. You find a lot of Nigerians now are now on the internet, either working, watching Netflix, or doing one thing or the other, buying and selling. Now we have an infrastructure that is not even, uh, you know, when, when it comes to the speed, you know, the, the, the bandwidth, but we are making use of this infrastructure that we got. We've got to take advantage of that. Uh, we need to start you know, even governments should actually, you know, be more transparent with the public than ever through technology. You know, technology makes it possible for people in positions, positions of authority, both medical, political, to open up direct channels to the public to issue guidance and explain how decisions are made. We can start, you know, through maybe, you know, COVID-19 is not a good thing, but we are seeing humongous amount of possibilities when it comes to governments and the private sector actually using technology to, to progress this country, to make a lot of changes or, you know, start doing new things through technology. When you look at policy considerations, uh, you know, we've got to start looking at our infrastructure and bandwidth. There's something in, 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 in telecoms that we call net to net neutrality. You know, policymakers, you know, you should start considering, you know, temporary relaxing things like that. You know, those rules that to give communication providers greater flexibility to manage their, their, their network traffic. So, for instance, what could happen is that we know that a lot of children are now at home trying to do remote schooling. What the telcos can do, because if they actually allow, you know, they have, they have the backing of the government, direct traffic, direct the bandwidth, to homes during a particular peak period when they know that people will resume uh, uh, you know, at, at night and they probably close at two. So they start driving, directing traffic where it is actually needed. Video conferencing, all those things. And that's actually what they're doing in, in places like UK now because a lot of schools in the UK have resumed and you struggle with bandwidth because when people are using Zoom to teach or Microsoft Teams, some classes they actually need um, to see each other um, through, through, through um, um, video conferencing. So again, you have to start routing those traffic uh, or the bandwidth to, to, to homes during that particular period. Again, supporting the digital economy. Policy decisions in this arena, we have a direct bearing on how easily firms can adapt to this, uh, new, you know, this new reality, uh, both in terms of supporting companies to keep going removing barriers to commercial models. Um, a lot of interventions, you know, oh, sorry, there are lots of uh, distractions when it comes to, you know, current policies across most sectors when it comes to technology. So we need a, te a technology powered economy, which will enable the companies actually, you know, a new, new set of opportunities will be opened up um, for economic policymakers to gain real time situational awareness. But when it comes to business continuity and digitization, um, as businesses cr scramble to move their operations online or reinvent themselves all together as digital first entities, governments can work with them to deliver timely and appropriate support. There is no country in the world that will try to go digital. If you look at Dubai, government has a lot of savings. We can't just leave it to the private sector. This crisis caused by coronavirus has overturned the strong force of inertia in many uh, traditional businesses and, and catalyzed uh, take up of digital services with businesses and families um, alike discovering new tools and adapting to the, them to their context. A lot of people didn't know about Microsoft, um, sorry, about Zoom. Now Zoom has actually, you know, a thousand percent multiplied their subscriptions, um, you know, uh, in, in the last seven weeks. 
uh, we got, you know, if you if you're you know, into social socializing with people, Zoom house party, you know, Microsoft team, a lot of people are describing things. And most of these tools are actually being used for, for, for business meetings, for pitches, you know. But longer term, this might put economies in a better position to accelerate productiv productivity, growth and adapt to the internet era. But in the short term, companies uh, put up the digital transformation will struggle. So there will be this initial struggle for people that have not really considered digitization. Uh, but in the long term, I, th I think everyone will benefit from that. Um, you know, if you look at the finance of the fintech. Sorry? Okay, so just a few things, um, you know, you know, a few things for, you know, my advice to policymakers, let the markets do their job. Um, the internet was designed to be resilient, broadband net networks were built for peak loads and rapid scaling. Um, we should just let the dynamics operate as intended and we all benefit as a country. We need to actually encourage, um, you know, the, the internet, embracing the internet. Um, I think government should push that. We should make things open, open data, open source, open standards. Uh, we should support innovation, but that is actually the direction. Uh, if you look at this country, even before COVID-19, where are the strength, the revenues have dropped less than 50% uh, because of the crude oil prices. Uh, there is no demand for our crude oil. All of us are, we are at home. I haven't bought fuel for eight weeks now. So I'm not consuming. So we don't have consumers for our crude oil. And that's the global thing. So, you know, we, we need to really, you know, go digital, encourage, you know, invest in technology and actually protect our future. Um, I will just close at that, at, at that point. Thank you. Thank you very, um, very um, useful uh, insight. Thank you. Next uh, panelist, Shola Adewale, and I'll be asking to talk to us about new challenges require, um, you know, new challenges require new thinking with human development. How can this be achieved? How can the government continue to do human while working remotely? What sort of trainings and sensitization do you think may be required? And what are the upside of this occurrence and how can the government take advantage of this? Hello? Yeah, uh, good afternoon, um, uh, co-panelists, and uh, good afternoon to our audience. Um, uh, great insights uh, so far, and uh, I, I think it's just fitting to close this with the people, di the, the people dimension. I, I think the, the biggest question that is in the room from, you know, the, the, the session by the, the head of service uh, all the way to um, Femi's session is, is about digital acumen. Um, I, I think if the government, uh, you know, or the subnationals or the national government wanted to position the people that uh, work for us, uh, the, the biggest curriculum is, uh, or the biggest, uh, the, the arrowhead of that curriculum will be, how do we raise digital acumen in my state, in my MDA, in, in the government? Uh, how do I do that? Uh, because uh, Femi closed by talking about, you know, uh, the, the, the re reduced demand for, uh, for oil uh, because we are not consuming. So in, in, a, in an overnight way, we are moving from an oil-based economy to a digital economy. Uh, organizations, MDAs, nations that are backward uh, as far as digital is concerned will struggle to thrive. Uh, in the in the in what is really our new normal, I think with the discoveries that we are all making from working from home now, there will be major decisions to be taken uh, whether we really do need all the travel uh, and all the face to face time. It's going to take a long time to build trust uh, in face to face uh, uh, meetings uh, anymore, particularly that we've seen the benefits. So the question: Where do we start? I think if you are trying to raise acumen in anything, the first thing to do is to assess your baseline. So where are we? Um, if we take uh, uh, Kaduna State uh, as an example, so in, you know, given all the major initiatives, the very laudable initiatives that are going on, um, what is the skill level of our people as far as 
Um, you know, this, these are things that we can work on. What are the mindsets that, that exist? Uh, you know, um, somebody may say, well, I already know the mindsets of uh, the average person who works in government or works in, the, in whatever sector. But it's important to have uh, numbers. Um, how do people behave? You know, how do we, what are the behaviors that are prevalent? Once we have set those, you know, that baseline and we have a baseline, you know, either per ministry or per government, uh, then we need to provide learning uh, and, and upskill. And, and there are opportunities that exist uh, globally and even regionally, even within Africa, uh, to take people into digital academies where they can learn these things. Um, but, you know, to undergird all of that, we also need clear policies around uh, remote working. Obviously, the, the policies that have uh, guided the way we worked in the past Will not uh, will not take us into the future. Uh, so I mean, even from something as elementary around the time you resume uh, and so on and so forth, you know, work starts at eight o'clock. If everybody does that and ends at five o'clock. Now, if you are working remotely, you are not commuting. Many of us who have worked remotely in the last seven weeks have discovered that we are working even longer hours. Uh, so is it therefore uh, still valid to have an eight to five? Uh, work policy. It's also important to equip our leaders, you know, the, the, the leaders uh, on how to lead in this new normal. Uh, so in the past, if I wanted to call my direct, you know, my assistant director, I will ask him to come to my office. I wanted to see him face to face. Uh, but now, uh, how do I lead people when there's no, uh, I might not be able to see them uh, face to face? Uh, so things like that, people also need training uh, on how to work from home. Besides training the leaders on how to lead in a digital world, uh, people need to know how to, uh, uh, to work from home. In the first few weeks, it, it was a challenge for many people. And I spoke to someone who said, you know, the way to do it is to wake up in the morning, get in the shower, uh, see if you are going to work, uh, and then that would help you uh, to, to, to get along. But I wanted to just wrap this up by, by, you know, by speaking to how the government can turn this to advantage. So a lot of research that we have done has showed us that a lot of jobs, even from the things we've said so far, a lot of jobs will uh, be lost, uh, but there will still be new jobs. So this is an opportunity for governments to walk its talk, to reskill the people, not just the people that work in government, but even to reskill the nation, as it were, starting from curriculum changes, uh, even from uh, the, the, the primary schools, all the way to the tertiary institution. I know that some of these initiatives are already happening uh, within the NUC and so on and so forth. But if we if we can come up with a national digital upskilling policy, ASAP, it will take us uh, very far. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Shola. That was um, very uh, clear and concise. Uh, we always know that it. Not more important than uh, putting the technologies in place. Objectives. Sorry, sir. I don't. I don't think we have him. Sorry, sir. Can you hear me? All right. Um, Femi, do you want to take that? So the question is, um, I think uh, Barista is struggling to think the private sector can contribute in assisting the federal government meet our national objective. You, you touched slightly on it by think the private sector in assisting the federal government meet our national IT objective. Um, um, th thank you, Damola. Um, um, to me, I think it's both ways. Um, um, for, you know, the private sector working with the government. Um, the first thing is actually, uh, if the government can actually take away a lot of the democracy, uh, the, the bureaucracies, um, um, you know, that is actually stopping a lot of things happening. So, for instance, if I take, you know, the fintech in you know sector. Um, there is a lot of things that can happen through that particular sector. Um, but again, um, it can only happen if we have government support. 
this country needs to go digital. Um, and the fast thinking countries now, uh, the, the future is about the country that go digital first. If you look at you know, UAE, for instance, they've got a minister responsible for AI. They are creating their future already. This is not Minister of Science and Technology. This is somebody responsible for artificial intelligence. So government just needs to provide the enabling environment and things will start happening. How best can you, how, how best can government work with the startups? There's a lot of potential with the startup and I grow comp I grow companies. But look at the SMEs in Nigeria when they need financial support. Especially if you look at the SMEs, now I'm really very sorry for a lot of SMEs. A lot of people have invested all their savings in starting an SME. Now, in the last eight weeks, they've been, you know, um, things have really gone south for them. How do we create that support, financial support? I know CBN has been talking about, you know, trying to support them. But, you know, this is the time we need to look at ourselves and say, guys, this is our future. The, 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 the way we, have, we have a lot of people in this country who are very intelligent, who are exporting their skills. We need to step in as a government. Um, in the UK, the government, for instance, has announced a new scheme to support technology and life, life, science, life science firms. And many of them are dependent on access to capital to stay afloat. This is a new announcement by the, by the UK. So there are new schemes, and Nigeria should follow suit. Look at where our future is heading and actually go for it and support this, this, this SIBs or the startups. Yeah, I grow companies, and I think that's that's our future. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Semi. Thank you, Semi, for that. I just got a question from uh, another ad attendee, and this is for Shola. Thank you for talking so passionately about about the people side. Are there specific trainings you will recommend for government and public service to cope with this situation? Shola? Yeah, th thanks, Damola. Yeah, um, ah, that's a that's a a, a big uh, a, a wild ba 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 bat of a question. I think, uh, like Femi said uh, earlier, we can even start from simple things like making sure that everybody can use these. Uh, video or virtual conferencing facilities that we have. Something as simple as that. I mean, tomorrow, I hear the Federal Executive Council is having their first ever meeting uh, digitally. Just imagine if one minister doesn't have a clue uh, and he doesn't want his uh, PA to come and help him operate it so that he doesn't transfer uh, something. Uh, but beyond that, uh, PwC also has uh, a digital academy. I mean, Femi leads the Experience Center where there is a uh, a, a, a major, major solution there around analytics, which is something analytics uh, underpins everything that we do as far as uh, digital and governance. I mean, we don't even know our numbers here. So if, if we can just expose the key people even to how to uh, manipulate data and understand data and use data, draw insights from data, that would be a good place to start. Virtual video conferencing, uh, elementary, take it up to data analytics. That's where we started from as PwC. Uh, making sure that everybody is uh, analytical uh, somewhat. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, The next question I have is for, okay, it's for the chief of staff. Um, okay, so it's obviously um, Kaduna has done well and you, are, you appear to be much better prepared than most. What advice do you have for federal, state, and local governments? And being able to manage the disruption caused by COVID-19 pandemic and other disruptions that may occur. Well, um, thank you very much um, for the uh, commendations that Kaduna has, has received. Um, to be completely honest with you, we think that we're still um, scratching the surface of this um, uh, issue. Um, there are a number of issues. I mean, <clears throat> government is faced with two things. First is inward looking and getting all our colleagues, officials to be able to function in a new digital public sector. But second and more importantly, is outward facing. 
how do we ensure that the very responsibility, the very mandate of government can continue to be achieved, which is service delivery in this new digital era? And that still keeps us up. So even if government is able to have its meetings and to um, communicate um, online, the most important thing is how does it deliver healthcare, education, water, road networks, infrastructure, um, protect its people during this time. And so digital also has to be able to move from just enabling government to really from enabling government to function itself, but also to enabling government to deliver services, which I think is where um, we're really going um, now today. Uh, and of course, for states, federal, local governments, one of the biggest issues that we're facing today, right now, as an emergency, is the issue of cybersecurity. Uh, because this is not a space that governments typically play in. Um, we are still facing um, uh, a director or a PAMSEC who would sign on with his son's um, device uh, and leaves his login on. And the next time we're having a very secure uh, meeting, a very secret meeting, uh, the son dials in and he's with his friends. You know, these kind of small issues um, that happen, um, how do you secure um, documents? Um, emails are now uh, the go-to for all hitherto secret files um, that might have identities of people that you don't want to reveal, but you have to send via email. So how do you secure all that? So, I mean, the entire cybersecurity issue um, needs to be looked at. And also, who are we leaving behind while we're delivering all this stuff, right? Because only a small population of our people are actually um, on digital services. Only a few people have mobile phones, for example. So who are we leaving behind when we say, for example, we're rolling out um, education online? For Kaduna, for example, we opted to go for radio because 80% of um, our people listen to radio. About 40% are the ones that are online. So just to cover for that 40% that would have been left out, we opted to go for radio, TV, and then did some online. So we have to look at as government, who are we leaving out as we're going into this digital cyberspace? Not everybody can follow us there, but we have to make sure that even those that can't follow us. Um, but of course, I mean, ultimately for me, and, and finally, the reduction of cost for government is phenomenal. I mean, last week I sat um, through a governor's forum meeting with 36 state governors. And I just couldn't help but imagine that in the past, this would mean 36 governors each with five to 10 people traveling to Abuja to have this, this meeting that we were having right there in our rooms. And the meeting went on for three, four hours and everything was discussed. So, I mean, I think that even after we go through COVID, there are some things that just need to not go back to what we used to do forever. We've had Northern States governors meeting on Zoom. Everybody has joined in. As we said, FEC is happening tomorrow. You know, NEC might happen uh, a week or so from now. And it will also... Uh, would have entailed 36 governors going to Abuja. But all these costs are now going to be saved. There are so many seminars that have happened internationally that many government employees have signed in online and done it. That's a cost saving for government. So I think that we all need to move in governments, as federal government, as local governments. You know, we need to move in, but we need to move in with the thought process that we shouldn't only be doing digital for doing government's sake. We should be doing it for doing governance. So we should deliver the services uh, and not leave out our people. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, um, for that uh, very uh, detailed response. It is interesting to know, um, particularly and tell about the examples of the state governors. Just imagine that you see with minimum five, six people heading to Abuja. Anyway, I think we're, we're getting there. Uh, I have another question here, and it's also directly sent to the minister. Do we have um, Kashim back online now? Okay, I, I guess it's still not here. This is directly to need as an agency, and I was hoping that it will be the one to take it. So, um, I'll move to uh, Dr. Bird. Dr. Bird, somebody says, uh, Dr. Bed, in your experience as a practitioner in the government and public service, do you think that there is a to change and why is this the case and how can such resistance be used to allow all the transformation that is required to happen in public? Okay, great question. 
Resistance to change, yes. Even in the private sector, there is resistance to change. Okay, so in any organization, uh, change is, is, is something people resist. You know, they will tell you, yes, we have been, this is how we have been doing it for ages, and we think it is the best way. But when they get to understand the other side, they will find out that, uh, yes, they could be better performers if only they can change. So there, will, there is resistance to change. There will be, and there, uh, it's, I think even in the public sector, it's worse. It is worse because um, um, in the public sector, you have quite some aged people, and that's why, uh, I mean, it will not be too much going back to what Kaduna uh, state what they have done in terms of the public sector revitalization program, you know, and trying to get the younger ones. For me, the younger ones are the people, you know, that should be really be running things properly because this is the digital age. You know, they understand uh, better things um, relating to, the, to, to technology. I'm not saying the older ones can't, you know, but for instance, you are calling for a meeting and then you get your son uh, signing in for you and so on, you using his device and so on. You know, in fact, even, even today, I, I know that there are some senior civil servants that can't even operate the laptop. Okay. So if you now introduce those changes that will force them uh, uh, to start logging into the laptop, signing, in, signing off things and so on, sending memos, many of them will want to resist initially but this can be addressed through change management uh, processes okay so once uh, these changes start i mean if what we've been talking of the uh, uh, go, the government going digital once they start all that and then uh, you need to put you need to have a change management team that will need to ensure that those changes achieved as expected. If you do not have a change management team that, for instance, will look at the different stakeholders, understand their needs and so on, try to find out the difficult ones within the system and how do you manage those difficult ones, and then putting out uh, communications as often as you can, um, trying to manage the different people, having change agents in different places. You know, if we don't do that, any of such changes that you bring, particularly in this area of technology, in the civil service, in the public sector, you are going to, it is likely to, to, to fail or succeed partially. So my, 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 my straightforward answer to the question is that, yes, there will be resistance to change and it is not unexpected, but that resistance can be managed by putting in place a good change management program. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Doctor. And um, I have someone in the one of the attendees that is actually that is concurring with your position. He actually says, and I quote: "To kill the resistance, we need change managers in all levels, uh, in all in all levels on, in the public sector. That's that's consistent with your position as well. There will be resistance to change, but we need to manage the change and uh, give people." Uh, explain what what is the need for everyone for us. thank you so i'm going to try and take one more question um okay i think i have um i have cousin back on, online now so i can take the need that question the question says what collaboration is needed running with other government agencies to meet the it need of the government and public service, and by extension to the private sector, especially due to the impact of the pandemic and our national response. Hello, Barisa Sudangi. Okay, I think I think um, I think I've lost him again. So, just going to hold out for maybe one more question before we round up the question and answer session. All right, um, I think we can conclude the question and answer.
at this stage and the round off on the panelist uh, session. Thank you very much um, to all my panelists uh, for the very detailed panel discussion and the answers to the participant questions. Uh, we believe this session today has been able to address key themes within uh, BCM for government and public service, and uh, it has opened path for further discussions in this regard. Um, if we get any other question before we get off the webinar, we will try and uh, answer them uh, and then share with you or when we upload the recorded uh, version of the webinar on our website. Uh, we now hand over to Ada Irekefe. Ada is the uh, Associate Director and Head of Disruption at PwC. Ada will run through the, Ada will run through the, the survey results and the results and then the Thank you. Okay, thank you, Damala. You heard um, because it was a little bit difficult um, um, hearing some of the um, panelists. Well, thank you again, Damala. Um, I actually found this session extremely insightful and um, informative. And um, it's clear from the quality of questions received and answer, um, the, the audience also um, did as well. So from the survey conducted earlier, uh, we've got some high level results, which I will go through now. Um, <clears throat> we had a good, um, a, a good base of respondents, which cut across the non-government uh, participants, such as the banks, oil and gas, and we also had the government respondents, which are uh, which also cut across the federal and state um, um, level. Um, one of the questions we asked, we asked what the expected duration of the COVID-19 impacts would be. A majority of all the respondents agreed that the impact of the COVID-19 will exceed 12 months, about 44% um, and 49% um, from the government respondent. Um, the other question we asked was, what type of impact uh, would COVID-19 have on operations? Majority of all the respondents agreed that so far there will be minimal impact on staff. Uh, minimal impacts, and um, they already have staff working remotely. Um, this was also, this view was also shared by government um, specific respondents. Uh, moving on to the next question, which was, uh, what are the major challenges faced by all respondents? Majority of our respondents, um, I would say about 48% believe that the uh, major challenges face would have to be the, that the organizations does not have um, infrastructure and hardware for staff to operate remotely. Um, only probably about 11% um, thought that their staff do not have tools to work remotely. I think that's something that we obviously need to address. Um, the same challenges were also faced by, um, by the government respondents. Um, the same um, percentage of roughly about 47% of um, government respondents also felt that there was not um, the structure and the hardware provided for staff was inadequate, inadequate to, to, some, um, to some level and that they had, um, they did not also did not have enough tools for their um, staff to work remotely with. So the next we asked um, what initiatives are all our or what initiatives are being considered by all our respondents to combat COVID-19. Uh, most of all the respondents view optimizing existing technology to accommodate remote working and investing in digital channels to enable remote working. Um, we also asked the same question to, to the government um, respondents. And they, um, okay, pretty, pretty similar. Sorry, guys, I'm actually reading, um, <laughs> analyzing the, um, the data. Okay, so most of the government respondents actually view optimizing existing technology to accommodate remote working 
as the major initiative to combat COVID-19. So I think we're all in sync um, as regards to that. Um, it's clear that the resultant impact of COVID-19 will greatly change how we conduct our businesses and also um, organization culture. Um, I mean, to my mind, um, this will be a determinant of how successful our organizations will be in the future going forward. So thank you. That wraps up the survey results. Thank you, Damola. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> wish you a very good evening and then enjoy the rest of your day. Um, just a final, on a final note, uh, PwC has got um, kept a knowledge hub for to support businesses and governments in their response to impact uh, of COVID-19. Uh, and this is a free uh, resource uh, for anyone to log in and uh, get some insight. We encourage you to take a note of this uh, website and then make a use of it. Uh, we also, you can also ask uh, COVID-19 resource on the PwC Nigerian Tax 247 mobile app, uh, available on both uh, Google Play and uh, Apple Store. Thank you once again and have a great evening. Thank you.